the, the imagination, like for most of Christian history, had been viewed suspiciously. Mm -hmm. But there's this movement in the British tradition with figures like Coleridge and MacDonald and Blake and Barfield that actually begins to see the imagination in a different way. Mm -hmm. Um, and and that leads to your point about which is what so fascinated me for this conversation was imagination as a truth bearing faculty and and I want to understand that so why don't we just dive into it and and let's keep going um, hey everybody welcome to the Legend Fiction Show today I'm joined by two people I have thoroughly grown to enjoy following on YouTube we have Shari and we have is it Nate Heil or Nate Hill I'm actually it's not Heil. sure it's Heil. Heil. Okay. Yep. Can we take 30 seconds and share a little bit of your backgrounds? You were telling me just before we started that you met over Discord and now you're, I don't know, fast friends and you're producing content constantly over on <laughs> Grail Country. Um, Nate, you've got a fascinating background. Uh, Shari, you lived in Switzerland for a while. So yeah, what, what are your stories? I live in the central interior of British Columbia uh, with my husband. I have three grown children who live in Europe. All of them are married. Uh, two, two of them have children. One of them is expecting. So I have four grandchildren. Um, my husband and I have been homesteading and self-sustaining since 1997. We lived in a very remote place for about three years and then moved to where we are now in 2000, um, mostly because the children would have had to go away from home for the last two years of high school, which we experienced with our oldest daughter and found it just to be too soon to say goodbye to your kids, you know? So, um, yeah, and then I met Nate through the Paul Vanderclay community um, on the Bridges of Meaning Discord server, I believe. I don't know if I met you on the Discord server or not. It was on Discord. It was on Discord. I actually remember the very first conversation we had. And it was actually, interestingly enough, it overlaps a lot with the conversation we're having today. Because the very oh, first funny. conversation we had, I asked you a question about like beings that were neither that, that were neither clearly beings of light or darkness the kind of like neutral beings and we had this conversation about like the idea of fairy and uh mcdonald's like concept of the imagination and there we talked about uh, we talked about this you know this sort of like interesting direction of the british tradition and so that was the very first conversation we had Funny, eh? how about some of your story nate um Okay, well, I am from uh, from Washington State. I, I grew up in a, in a small town uh, near the coast at the mouth of the Chehalis River called Aberdeen, which probably a lot of people have heard of because of a, a little band named Nirvana that came out of Aberdeen. Um, and uh, I, uh, I tended... One of the weirdest things about me is that I attended both Thomas Aquinas College, which is a very conservative, traditional Catholic, great books college that would, well, it now has two campuses. But when I attended, it was only the original campus in Santa Paula, California mm -hmm. and Evergreen. So <laughs> I graduated from Evergreen because for various reasons, I moved back to Washington and I went back and finished my my degree up at Evergreen. But I finished my degree at Evergreen doing a bunch of independent contracts on very unevergreen subjects like early church fathers and things like that. So um, my education had my education. I, th I think technically it says journalism on my degree. And I did an internship in college as a sports journalist, mm -hmm. but really mostly it's, it, it was, it was a great book slash slash classics kind of education. Uh, and, uh, I, I worked as a line cook in college, uh, and I really, really fell in love with that. And it's, and I very, and it was kind of in my, it was kind of in my blood. There's like, there are a lot of chefs in my family. My grandfather, who's the great hero of my life was a chef. And I just really fell in love with that. And that's what I did for a long time. Um, I, I worked in I worked in the culinary field, um, 
worked my way up from being a line cook to um, a sous chef is as high as I ever got. And then I started having kids and it's like, wow, I love this job, but it's a terrible job for raising a family. Mm. Um, I miss every, I, I, you know, it's like, it's, I missed almost every birthday, every holiday. Um, it's just not a very family for, and the hours are kind of terrible. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, you know, it's not a nine to five, <laughs> you know? So, um, it, it, I decided that I wanted to transition into something else. Uh, and uh, I ended up eventually working in state government in a bizarre field that hardly anybody understands. I like have one of those jobs where even if I explain it to you, you won't understand what I'm talking about. It's kind of like the, the, Ch the Chandler effect. Um, I work in public disclosure. Your secret agent. Your secret agent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So why the name Grail Country? Why was that important to you? Okay, so uh, there's Grail Country. I I I call it Grail Country because I some something about like what's going on in these dialogues to me is is connected to the idea of the Grail Quest. Like when mm -hmm. when people are having these deep conversations about things, there's a process of discovery that happens mm -hmm. that to me is that's what the grail quest is about because you're discovering you're what you're ultimately discovering is, is your true self mm -hmm. and you're helping others uncover their true selves and in, in, in these deep dialogues, like that's, that's what's happening when you're doing it right. Um, and people get us, you know, people, people can sense this when it starts to happen too. People can talk about, you know, sensing the spirit in the room um, and they know that there's something that's beyond them. That's, that's, that's drawing them toward, toward it. And this is really what the grail is all about. And so I decided to call it grail country. I was also, I was also inspired by a line from, uh, from Parsifal where Garnamond, uh talks about time becoming space in the country of the grail. So, Oh, that's so cool. So that's so, it was like, that. so just like my sense of what these dialogues are about. And then that line from Parsifal, um, about here time becomes space when Gernamans is talking about the, the realm of the grail, the country, the, the, the land, you know, the, the strangeness of the land where the, where the grail is found. It's mm -hmm. a place where time becomes space. And of course, this connects to, you know, notions of fairy and all the other kinds of things that we're, we're talking about today too. That's so, kind of interesting too, in, in light of the idea of the difference between plot and setting. I've been thinking about that quite a bit because I was listening to J.F. Martell talking about it in a podcast that he does. Um, and uh, it was regarding the, they were talking about Piranesi. And um, <clears throat> he was saying how he, he doesn't really care for books with plots because he gets, he, he kind of. There's like five of them. Who cares? <laughs> yeah. He kind of, he, he, you know, he, he can already <laughs> figure that out. He, he loves setting. And, um, and then he pointed out how Game of Thrones was essentially comprised of just setting for the longest time. And then it started to go downhill when they stuck a plot into it, right? <laughs> right. Um, yeah. Downton Chester, Abbey, maybe. Chesterton or... said there's one plot. It, like every story is the knight, the dragon, and the lady. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is where, uh, what's his name? Um, oh, shoot, I can't think of the author's name. He's famous, famous uh, guy. He uh, he talks about you know every story is a U shaped journey right, right. every every plot is a U shaped journey so Isn't that but anyway um, no that's not Barfield that he, um, he's a um, Kurt Vonnegut says that uh, okay. yeah so anyway um, the interesting thing about setting because when you said time becomes space I was thinking that that's actually the that's actually that thing that that makes setting so incredible because it, it opens up that whole world of discovery right which is kind of what we're made for right when, when we when we move into a place we want to explore it well i don't know now i haven't i haven't been following and i've i've read the mcdonald uh essay on the imagination that you've been doing this series on but it's been a long time since i've read it and uh maybe there's some distinction between what mcdonald says and what but and what Coleridge says, but what Coleridge says is that 
that this this thing that we, he calls it secondary imagination. So and he distinguishes it from fancy. And I think McDonald makes the same distinction. And I think he's probably inspired by Coleridge. Oh, yeah, he says he is. Yeah. OK, OK. So what he says it is, is that he relates it to synthesis. Yes. And, and the overcoming Sophia, of the actually. opposites. It's Sophianic for George MacDonald, interestingly right. enough. And 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 George MacDonald just drops the secondary imagination. He just calls it straight up imagination and right. the other fancy. And so for whenever he's talking about imagination, it's divine. Right. And he, he often switches into the feminine pronouns, right. she, yeah. when he talks about imagination. Well, Coleridge says that... It's, Coleridge makes the distinction between primary and secondary imagination because his distinction that he makes is that primary imagination, he says, is basically the, the thing that undergirds all power of human perception altogether, and it happens automatically. So I can see why McDonald would want to drop it because it's really not necessary because it's mm -hmm. actually both are ultimately concerned with this function of the secondary imagination, mm -hmm. which is this power of synthesis. And it sounds more like awareness might be just a better word for the first kind then. Yeah. Aware. Yeah. Aware. Well, attention, maybe attention. attention yeah. Mm. You know, so this is why it's so Sophianic, Nate, because what McDonald says is that we live and move and have our being in God's imagination. So if you just take that, that, that just that simple statement and you go, okay, where is God's imagination? Where do we live and move and have in creation? Right. In creation. And how is that God's imagination? Well, he created it. Where did it come from? Right. And 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 so, and then and then George goes on to say that, and this is Sophia, right? <laughs> creation. <laughs> so then then George goes on to say that um that within the world of the senses. So any anything that's created is going to affect your senses, whether it's hearing or seeing or tasting or whatever. All the all the senses plus intuition. Um, those things he calls the forms. So they're not Platonic forms for him. And I always like to make that distinction because people right away go Plato, right? When you say forms, it's not Platonic because the forms are the actual representations themselves and within those forms is the meaning okay the meaning is already given by god so when god creates the form it contains a meaning within it and our imagination has been tasked with lighting the lamp within the form so that we can see the meaning in it. And so then he goes on to describe how the half of our language comes from creation, right? We, we use the things outside of ourselves to talk about the things that are going in on inside of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so he says it's creation itself with which we clothe our thoughts, oh, right? Awesome. It becomes the wardrobe with which we clothe our own thoughts. And so when I when I heard all that, I was immediately struck by the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Okay? Mm -hmm. Because Lewis has the kids going through a wardrobe, number one. And he and Lewis himself says he there's not one single book that he's ever written that George MacDonald isn't either directly quoted or all his ideas have been used. And where where do they come out? They come out at a lamppost. Okay, so Moving they're on the nose delightfully, right? So their imagination lights the lamp within the, the sensual world, right? The world of the forms that they find themselves in, which is now Narnia, mm -hmm. and that is their imagination at work, right? What I always thought was so cool about the four children is each child represents a different reaction to reality. Lucy being an enchanted acceptance, um, Edmund being a rejection uh, of it, um, Peter wanting to control it, and and Susan trying to redefine herself against it. Mm. That always struck me as interesting. So in that sense of as you clothe yourself with, with reality in this imagine, imaginary way, um, how do you respond to that? What does that reveal about you? 
how you respond to imagination? Well, you know, it's interesting because we're right now in the part of the essay where George, he talks about repression of the imagination. And he says that we, people who repress the imagination, repression for him is is only, um, it happens through dogmatism. Dogmatism mm -hmm. is what represses the imagination. Mm -hmm. And he gives the example of a child flapping its wings around. And, you know, the dogmatic person tells them just to stop being silly. Okay. George makes the point, and I love the point, and I always have to make it, because he says, they don't ask, are you an angel or are you a pterodactyl? <laughs> right? They have no interest in where that child is. And, and for I George like you said that, not what it is, but, but where they are. Where they are, because for yeah. George MacDonald... God sees things as they are. So there's this sense, there's, I always find with him, there's this underlying sense of reality, of a reality that exists beyond what we, you know, the superficial. It, it's, it's, it's deep below the surface, right? And anyway, he uses the example of Lady Macbeth for the repression of of the imagination. And I used in our last conversation, the, the example of Raskolnikov, right? So you have these two people who can will themselves to do something that is rationally, it's rationally logical, right? What the, what they, what they actually decide to do. Um, and then George says, uh, you know, in Lady Macbeth's case, her, her imagination comes back to haunt her, right? Because it, it for him, the imagination is the voice of God, right? So, so she, you know, she she thinks she can abstract herself away from her imagination, which is really interesting because I think, um, you know, whenever I talk about imagination, what I notice is a lot of people say, um, oh, you know, they go right away to the, oh yeah, it's so much fun to make stuff up, but y you can't make anything up. Right. And, and, and this is the first part of his essay. Only God creates ex nihilo. You create from the forms, from the things that are already given. And those things contain the meaning. Right. They already contain it. So whatever you talk about, you talk, you're talking about what actually is. Imagine that. It's already there. But we're okay. So Sherry, that that seems to blur the distinction between fancy and imagination to me. What you just said. Yeah. Well, it okay. So now, he, now we're in that section of the of the essay where he's talking about cultivating the imagination, and so what he does is he says, if you find your children engaged in fanciful uh, imaginings, you have to t you have to discourage it. Okay, but and he has this beautiful line in there. He says. Don't tell them to, to stop dreaming dreams. Teach them to dream nobler dreams. I was going to say, it seems like attention would seem to be the difference between fancy versus yeah. imagination. Because if you're not paying attention to what's happening, then uh, well, then it's fanciful. Well, and he, also says, he also says that the, the duty of the imagination is to find out the works of God, mm -hmm. right? And so I think that's that's kind of a compass for me when it comes to the fancy and the imagination. Like, is, what am I doing? Am I seeking out the thing? You know, am I trying to understand God better, this mm -hmm. underlying reality? Or am I, you know, in the closed world of the serpent, let's say, Nate, something like that. Right. So for Coleridge, like, more, like the difference is, is that like fancy doesn't actually create, doesn't have any, does not have any bit doesn't have any creative power it doesn't mm -hmm. it can't actually create anything yeah, like even, even in a secondary sense because it actually just like logically recombines elements um rather Fancy? than correct and he uses he uses the he uses the poetry of of cowley and contrasts it with milton to give an example of, of, of what he's talking about between uh, fancy and imagination, where Cowley is just basically engaging in bad similes and bad metaphors, whereas Milton actually creates something. Hmm. I don't know. That's a little bit confusing to me. 
George does talk about recombination, and that is the only like because because we don't create ex nihilo, right? He reserves that for God, and so you know he says at one point in in the essay that um, he wants to reserve the word creation for God alone because he wants mm. to he wants to have it as ex nihilo, but then he gets into this idea of recombining things, um, which is which is the task of the of the maker, right? The poet. Uh, and and um and so he says he will allow <laughs> in that case for the word creation right but he but he but he has a caveat that you know he really doesn't he really wants to leave that as ex nihilo so there is a there is a, a um there's an idea of creation um in in the recombination um we're just finishing up actually tonight. We're going to finish up the the culture part of the essay where he talks about um, discouraging fancy. And so mm -hmm. um, maybe I'll have more thoughts on that later. Sounds like a, a, a word. Well, Tolkien's word of subcreation would seem to be more appropriate to, to use there. So yeah, what I'd I love to do, Sherry, is um, as we were chatting uh, before, I'd love to have you come back to talk a little more attentively or intensely on this this essay or this his mm -hmm. line of thinking because it's so directly influenced inklings who've gone on to be um phenomenally influential when it comes to storytelling and so on mm -hmm. um and i'd like to ask you uh nate you've mentioned several times how imagination as a truth-bearing faculty was something that deeply moved you and has um deeply resonated can you share well with yeah us because that? i'm a, i mean i mean i'm a recovering rationalist <laughs> but I, but what I also, <laughs> well, uh, my natural inclination, my, my natural, I, I, I mean, I've always been kind of an intellectual, a person with an intellectual bent. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think like Barfield himself, like I always felt this tension, but, to be, I, but I've also I, like, I've also always been kind of a creative person too. Mm -hmm. Like uh, um, you know, I, I write poetry and, uh invent role-playing games and so i do all these I do all these creative things too but i was a you know i was a debater i have a very keen rational mind i'm like very good at linear reasoning um and that was very much what i leaned into it is also what i leaned into like i had a i had a convert i had, like i was raised pentecostal and became an agnostic from a fairly early age because, well, I, I did have an intellectual bent and I had a lot of questions and I wasn't, I mean, it's the Pentecostal tradition is not a very intellectually robust tradition and there weren't a lot of answers to my questions. And, and so I was agnostic. I was agnostic when I entered Thomas Aquinas college too, but I kind of, I was, I got exposed to like, like, like some of the better rationalistic side of, of Christianity. And this, that, that led me to kind of explore Christianity. And I had a sort of like a rational intellectual conversion, but in, at least in my case, like that didn't, that didn't last because there's always, there's always a better argument that you're going to like, <laughs> if, you, <laughs> if you're reliant totally on like just linear reasoning, there's an always a better argument to be found on somewhere out there. So mm -hmm. if you've based your if you've based your faith on purely linear reasoning and rationality, eventually it's going it's it's going to go away. It's mm -hmm. like gonna, it's not going to be lasting. So yeah. I spent a good chunk of my adult life as a and as a, as an agnostic. I was never I was never an atheist. I was never hostile toward people of faith. I always had respect for people of faith. Um, and actually looking back at some of my old poems that like there, there's a sort of like surface nihilism, but you can see like there's another layer, like beyond there, there's another layer beyond that where you can see like where there's another part of my mind that wasn't my rational mind that sensed that there was something more to this story. Um, That's what and, happens when you write, Nate. <laughs> and so, it's revelatory. Right, right, exactly. And so, like, and then I started reading. I started. You know, I started. I was reading David Bentley Hart, which, of course, appeared to my uh, appealed to my rational mind. 
and showed me like different dogmatic possibilities within the faith that I had like never realized were possibilities. Mm -hmm. um, and that, but at the same time, like even that wasn't enough. Like I, I, re I read David Bentley Hart as an agnostic for a very, very long time mm -hmm. without being mm -hmm. like persuaded to like become Christian again. Uh, and it was ultimately Barfield that was like, oh, wait a minute. What is this? What is like <laughs> this? And he, and when he introduced that idea to me as like imagination as a truth bearing faculty, that, that just like, and the idea of participation, it's like, I couldn't deny like part participation, like the idea, per the, the idea of participation was very evident to me. And I don't know why, because other people have a hard time seeing it. But there's, it's that, like, I think, and I don't know what it was about me that made, that made me not want to, like, rationalize away the experience of participation. But to me, like, what that meant was immediately obvious. I think because it's because you're it, a chef. I think it's because you're a chef. That you you that's why? Participation. But yes, it immediately it immediately made sense to me. And it's like once I saw mm -hmm. imagination and participation as part of the equation, it's like, oh, it's like, okay, we've been we're not really being empirical mm -hmm. at all when we say we're being empirical because we've at what we've all we've done is we've created we've created a system and a worldview that brackets out like probably more than half of the equation. And there's all these things that we have deemed untrustworthy and suspicious because they're subjective that are universal and ubiquitous and mean something. And that point to something more to this reality than what we've reduced it to, this world of dead objects that we've decided that we live in isn't real for it isn't what's isn't is not the totality of reality for anyone mm. like any <laughs> they can intellectually convince themselves of that but that's not actually the world they live in so here they, and here, they have to deny their own experience they have to deny their own experience of reality in order to cling to that illusory version of reality mm -hmm. and, and so this flipped me like immediate almost immediately from being a rationalist to a mystic because it's like oh i've been aware of like these things have been on the periphery of my awareness all the time but i have been suppressing them and just giving in to these cultural pressures to just discount these things but there's no reason to discount them like why am i discounting them you can't give me a justification for it so when i when i listen to you know a piece of music that that I find overwhelmingly moving that simultaneously fills my heart with joy and brings me to tears at the same time. in this sort of like weird mixture of, of bliss and sadness that feels like it, like something's calling to me. Why the hell would I ignore that? Why, why would I just say, Oh, that's just a, you know, chemical process in my brain or whatever, mm -hmm. as if that's actually a coherent explanation of what's happening. Cause it's not. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> so oh, there, I have too many questions, and we're almost out of time here. Like, I'd yeah. I'd love for you to give an overview of who Barfield is, because it's um, I had no idea who he was, and I only just learned that he passed only thirty years ago or something. So mm -hmm. his yeah, contribution he lived for a very long time. Yeah, so he his contribution well to the Inklings was very very formative. Um, and and so what I'd love to do, Nate, is invite you back to talk more about about that. Um, okay. And, and then Sherry, I'd love to have you come back to talk more about, about McDonald. But if mm -hmm. in the last three minutes or so that we have, um, would either of you uh, maybe each share um, to that idea of imagination as a truth bearing faculty, uh, why that is so, why is that important to you? Why do you, why is that real? Um, especially in, in, since this is for writers and authors and so on, to give that sense of confidence that what you imagine can be uh, important and you should pay attention and go deeper and, and not just keep it at the level of fancy, but take it up, elevate it to that level of imagination. 
any parting thoughts on on that? Well, for Sherry, me, it, it, it's related yeah. to perception. Like, it's actually the things I was like the example I just gave. Mm -hmm. Like, what faculty are when 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 your senses are 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 taking in a piece of music? Well, Barfield in Saving the Appearances uses the example of like hearing the the song of a thrush and what's actually going on when you hear the song of a thrush. But let's just let's just roll with my example. It's like what's actually what's what's going on when I when I hear that piece of music and I have the response that I have to that piece of music. It, there's more going on than just my sense perceptions of that only. Like there's a there's I have. There's another there. There is some other part of me that is responding to that. I have I'm responding that to with my, I'm, I have an intuitive, imaginative, uh, inspirational response to that as well. Well, I would argue that intuition, imagination, and inspiration are just as valid senses that you can trust just as much as sight, hearing, sound, and taste. Um, and I think that they have a that they have a, they have a valence with with what we what we call the spiritual. Although I don't think I don't think I, I think reality is just one reality. Mm -hmm. And that's that sort of spiritual material division is is a mistake. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I think I think the imagination is the truth bearing faculty. I feel like I'm in grade six and I'm writing an essay. <laughs> to start out with the proposition um because because it is only through the imagination that you can find truth so george mcdonald says that um truth is um how does he put that now um poetry is truth in beauty and and um, and I'm just going to read um, I'm going to read a little quote from the essay. He says, "For the world is allow us the homely figure, cozy, the cozy figure." He uses the word homely, and <laughs> I always think people are misinterpreting that as ugly. Um, the human being turned inside out. For the world is the human being turned inside out. All that moves in the mind is symbolized in nature. Or, to use another more philosophical and certainly not less poetic figure, the world is a sensuous analysis of humanity, and hence an inexhaustible wardrobe for the clothing of human thought. Take, the, take any word express, expressive of emotion. Take the word emotion itself, and you will find that its primary meaning is of the outer world, in the swaying of the woods, in the unrest of the wavy plain, the imagination saw the picture of a well-known condition of the mind and hence the word emotion. Um, and this is why it's a truth bearing faculty because we're surrounded by the truth. Yeah. This is, this is, this is to me why, why it's so important to understand that the imagination is the light that lights the lamp within the forms, right? That that and that thought right there, I think, pairs beautifully with what you were saying about participation, Nate. Because right. I think most of our viewers have right. are not don't know what that yet means. That right there, that sense of when I'm looking at fields of waving grain or the ocean, and I recognize not invent and a meaning for what's happening inside me, but I recognize yes. that out there is happening inside me. That's the sense of. Uh, where I am now comes from an original participation, as Barfield would say, where the world and I are, were one, and it used to be obvious and apparent. Now it's something that has to be uh, imaginatively, um, not just conjured forth, but um, you have to work at it now because of where we are in human development. It used you know, to be I, far more obvious to the past. Yeah, I, you know, I, I like to encourage people indirectly in, um, to to believe what they what they're looking at you know believe it you know right. i see the ocean i see me okay and and there's no there's no abstraction i see part of me or i see how i feel no i see me 
I see me. You know, I, I was listening to Martin Shaw talking about mythology, and a lot of the gods in in myth in mythology are simply called by what they are, right? Bear, jaguar, raven, mm -hmm. right? As soon as you say the 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 bear god or the god of the river, you've already mm -hmm. committed the the sin of division. Okay, the casting of apart. Distracted. Right, and it's and also you've gotten out of how the ancient mind actually th thought of the gods, right? Right. So and it's like Thor is not Thor. Thor isn't the god of thunder. You, that's the modern way of thinking about it. Thor right. is yeah. the god thunder. The thunder. Exactly. And so you know what came to my mind was the Eucharist. The same thing, right? Fully bread and fully wine and fully divine. Right. It, th and then it goes right to the two natures of Christ, fully, fully God and fully human. And then you you look at the raven in, in North American First Nations legends and he is fully raven and fully God or fully. Right. right. Fully raven and fully God. Sherry, I have this this this. I was thinking as you as you were talking, tell me whether you think that there's a there's a bridge here. Do you think that this like. This sort of like Coleridgean, McDonald, like Blakeian, like British Christian tradition idea of the imagination, because that's really the only place you find it. Like mm -hmm. it really is a unique contribution of the British Christian tradition. Do you think there's a is, do you think there's a there's a connection or a through line when Peterson talks about how we perceive meanings prior to perceiving objects? Is he is is there is there a connection there to be made? Perceive leanings? Meanings. Oh, meanings. Right. Oh, yeah. So like so the, it's like you don't perceive the object cup. You 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 as like it's great that you, you perceive it as graspable. Well, as well, you fillable. perceive its function. Essentially, you perceive it's fun like there's a connection with like essentially yeah. like he 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 makes function and meaning sort of yeah connected. Is that is that I don't know. I'd have to is that similar to this idea of uh, of illuminating the forms? I don't it think seems so. to me uh, you don't think so. Okay. Well, I have to think about it, actually. I haven't thought about it that way, but right off the top of my head, it doesn't feel like it. Because if you think about the fully bare, fully God thing, you're looking at some kind of powerful animal, right? That can choose to destroy you or 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 not, right? And Even it's, a synthesis. it's also and a it's synthesis. a synthesis. It's a right. synthesis of opposites, too, right? Which is exactly what Coleridge says the secondary imagination does. Yeah. Yeah. This is fascinating, yeah. friends. On that note, we have to wrap for today, but I think we're we going to come back and we're going to dig into these a little bit more because as uh, those in the community who are watching faith-inspired fiction authors, the imagination is one of the key things that we're using constantly. And this is part of the mission of legend fiction is how to help us be more attentive uh, and more aware to, and I love Nate how you brought these out, the imagination, intuition, and inspiration, and how they are like senses that we use to understand what's happening or to participate in the angelic world, what that means. And we're actually going to get into that because Nate, I want to chat with you about that world and, and the imaginal realm and so on, the perilous realm, grail questing. And uh, Sherry, I'd love to go more deeply into McDonald because the few gems you've shared today are just riveting. So... Thank you both, and we yeah, look forward to having you. you back for parts thank, two and three. Thank you, Dominic. It's good to, good to talk to you.